All right, internet, the time has come. Yesterday, I did my general reactions and news video breakdown for the Wheel of Time trailer. Today, you're gonna get the full breakdown. Full spoilers, full nerdgasm, me being full of shit, lots of full stuff. Join me as I break down all of the things, large and small, from the Wheel of Time teaser trailer. <laughs> All right, folks, the time has come, and this is gonna be a long one, so let's not waste any time. We're gonna go through the trailer scene by scene, and I will not only break down all of the Easter eggs, the references, the generally cool stuff, but I will also be letting you know what I liked and what I did not like from the trailer using a nameless appropriate tracking system. You will know it when you see it. But before diving into all the fun, let's throw up a spoiler warning. Today's video will carry a spoiler rating of red with major spoilers running all the way through a memory of light. If you haven't read the entire series, you are going to be spoiled here. You have been warned. So the trailer opens with a scene of Nynaeve played by Zoe Robbins pushing Egwene played by Madeline Madden from the top of a cliff into the water. Now note that both Nynaeve and Egwene have their hair braided in this shot. There has been speculation that this could be part of Egwene coming of age, but it is likely given that what we know of the characters are aged up already, that she is either becoming a member of the women's circle or becoming an apprentice wisdom. But look at those braids. Another note here is that Madeline Madden confirmed on Twitter that this was actually her being pushed off and that it was a 12 meter height. For those of us of Americans who don't know what a meter is, 12 meters is roughly 40 feet. So props to Madeline Madden for doing her own stunts. Also, take note of the clothing here. We will come back to this. We then open to a beautiful landscape shot of the Two Rivers area. Those mountains are the Mountains of Mist, and as we pan down from that wider shot, you can see this area that almost seems to be a quarry or an area where there's like a sheer cliff face. You then see in the next shot in the village, you're gonna see that same cliff face from a slightly different angle, as well as the same mountains in the background. I think it's safe to say that the village lies right down here in this shot. Now, you will notice I'm not calling it Emmons Field. The Amazon Prime description of the show refers to the village as Two Rivers, so it appears that that's a change they're making for the show. Another change is the proximity to the mountains of mist. In the books, Emmons Field is almost a day's ride from the mountains. It appears they are kind of reorganizing the layout of the two rivers a little bit, but we don't know quite why yet, or we don't know totally how they are. But the village does appear to be very close to the mountains. Now coming back to this area that looks like a quarry. Now in the books, the road that leads into the Westwood towards the mountains of mist and the Althor farm is called the Quarry Road. Maybe the road leading into the town is called the Quarry Road, or they're reimagining the town that they all live in as a quarry or a former quarry. Maybe we'll find out because this certainly does have that quarry feel to it. Now, as we move into the village itself, you will see the village green and the wine spring in at the back of the village. This is obviously a change in design from the books, but this entire set was built from scratch and it looks absolutely breathtaking, if not slightly different. Now we see the village busting with life, with children playing and chickens roaming around. Truly a bustling small village. You will see people doing business here as well as their little small storefronts around. I love the attention to detail. Now this right here appears to be Sen Bui, played by David Stern, or at least someone that looks very similar from behind. And if you look close, you can also see someone that appears to be Perrin carrying a water basin and wearing something that looks like blacksmith's clothing. I'm not totally sure if that's him, but it certainly resembles him. And judging by the layout with the cliff face that we talked about earlier, he appears to be coming from the direction of the river in that wider shot as well. So maybe that he went to get water. We then head inside the wine spring inn and find Rand, Matt, and Perrin having drinks. Now you can see right as we move in that Matt is picking up a set of dice showing that he enjoys dicing from the very beginning this is obviously foreshadowing matt later on making an absolute fortune with his dice now the interior of the wine spring inn is awesome these intricately carved columns are amazing now keep in mind guys this set was built for the show i think it looks outstanding now one thing that you can might notice here is that the inside of the inn is bust like like probably more than is ever described in the books if you look here and here you could see villagers taking part in the coveted Two Rivers tradition of smoking that good old Two Rivers tobacco. I love that that made it into the show. You see all those pipes back there. You can also see women around the inn in their braids, showing that women of the village all wear their hair in braids because they're of age. Now this shot of Matt just screams Matt to me. That, that grin looks mischievous and whatever he is saying, 
Perrin and Rand seem simultaneously entertained and hesitant on whatever Matt is suggesting. Notice also that they have been drinking for a little bit as they all have two cups right next to them. So they've been here for a little bit having some drinks. In walks Egwene now with Nynaeve looking very approvingly upon her. Nynaeve is wearing the exact same outfit that she was in the opening shot of the trailer when she pushes Egwene into the water. However, Egwene is wearing something completely different. My guess is that whatever initiation that Egwene has gone through is over now and she has freshened up and is being presented here as either an apprentice wisdom or a new member of the women's circle. There is clearly some announcement of her arrival because this guy right here turns to stare at Egwene as she walks in. And I doubt everybody turns to stare at the door whenever someone enters the inn. We then cut to Rand, again staring with those beautiful eyes like a puppy dog at Egwene. Notice the actual care in his eyes for her. Something that I don't think really comes through in the books, but we're gonna come back to this. We then also see Nynaeve looking approvingly again at Egwene, but also kind of giving a half-hearted smile. I wonder if she knows Egwene gave something up for whatever this decision maybe jeopardized her relationship with Rand, and she isn't quite sure if she feels good about that. I don't know, but that smile looks like something's up. We then cut to this wide shot of six folks on horses galloping away. Now, with closer inspection, this is Moraine, Lan, Rand, Matt, Perrin, and Egwene. Noticeably absent is Nynaeve, which makes me think this is the group leaving the two rivers after the winter night attack. This also appears to be the sandy beach-like area from the TV Guide article with Moraine. You'll notice the scenery here is changing slightly also from what we saw earlier with the two rivers. We then cut to a scene of Steppen, Kareen Nagashi's warder, kissing an Aes Sedai ring and crying. Now, from what we see later in the trailer, this appears to be at her funeral. Now, you can see the flames rising in front of him. Keep that in mind as we will come back to this later. We then get to the money shot from the trailer, from most people I've talked to at least. We see here Egwene rising out of the water through some inky dye in the water in the colors of brown, green, red, yellow, white, gray, and blue. Hmm, that sounds familiar, right? I think you might be led to believe that this has something to do with Egwene's testing in the White Tower. And while that even feels backed up with these two figures in the background wearing red and blue, are those Aes Sedai? Nope, I think you're wrong. I actually think this takes place before the first shot of the trailer. For one, let's start with Egwene's hair. In this scene, her hair is completely unbraided but she is literally wearing the exact same dress she was in the opening shot, implying it is the same day. Second, let's go back to that opening shot. See the color stained into her dress when Nynaeve pushes her? That yellow is in the exact same place as the scene of her coming out of the water. My guess is this is the beginning of her testing to be a member of the women's circle or becoming a woman or whatever ceremony it is they do in the Two Rivers, not the White Tower. But what about the exact colors being used that represent the Seven Ajas? Well, these colors are known around the world, or at least anywhere where there are Aes Sedai, and perhaps they're symbolic for ceremonies involving women's circles or mm, wisdoms or anything like that. There is certainly a lot to learn about here, but I think this scene comes before the opening shot. I also love how the narration on this scene of Moraine speaking ends with becomes legend, right as Egwene rises out of the water. This is completely foreshadowing what Egwene will become in the books, and that is a legend. We then pan to the streets of Tarvalin with the big reveal of the White Tower at dawn in a very, very stunning shot. Again, this shot here is amazing. We have dragon mount smoking in the background, indicating that something is stirring. The White Tower dominates this shot as well. We'll talk more about it when we get further into the trailer, but the one thing that is clear is the intention here was to show that the White Tower dominates the island and it's the focal point. Just as the Aes Sedai dominate and they are the center of power in Tarvalin. Now I've seen some people say that they thought the White Tower looked small here and I could not disagree more. I think they actually increased the size by quite a bit for the show over the way it's described in the books. Now in the books, the White Tower is roughly 600 feet tall and while it is the tallest building in Tarvalin by far, the island is roughly the size of Manhattan Island, so it would appear like a lone, tiny skyscraper in a town. However, in this shot, the city is smaller than what the books describe it as, significantly so actually. This island is not anywhere near the size of Manhattan Island, and if it was, then that White Tower would be incredibly massive. It appears that the show has made the White Tower slightly larger and elevated it on a hill while making the city a little bit smaller, which I think is more realistic, but it does make the tower look 
gargantuan. In the distance here, you can also see one of the bridge towns. Based on the orientation here, I would guess that that is Allendare along that hill over there. So we next move to a shot of Maureen entering what is likely the Wine Spring Inn. And just given the dramatic nature of showing her feet before her face, I would guess that this is our first time seeing Maureen on screen walking into the inn. Early on, Rafe mentioned that one of the things he was most excited about seeing was the shot of Moraine walking into the Wine Spring Inn for the first time. So I think that shot might be what we're looking at here. Now in this shot, Moraine is not wearing her Kisiera, but we do see her Great Serpent Ring, and it does contain a blue stone inside of it. This seems to confirm that the Great Serpent Rings will have colored stones reflecting the Aja of the wearer. Now this does open up the question of what Accepted will wear and how our Wonder Girls will be able to traipse around the world pretending to be Aes Sedai with just Accepted Rings, but I suppose they'll come up with a way to do that. Here we move back to Egwene in the river floating down the river. For one, this water is incredibly blue, so I want to move somewhere with water that clear. Probably spring water here is what we're looking at, hence the wine spring. But second, I love how her floating down and not fighting the river is reflecting of surrendering to Sidar and how it is often described as like a roaring river Sidar is. I would be shocked, absolutely shocked, if there is not some imagery or dialogue in the show telling Egwene to surrender to the rapids. You heard it here, it will be coming. And now we get to this beautiful shot of the Hall of the Tower inside of the White Tower. We are seeing this from directly behind the Amarlin seat, both the throne that is the seat and the Amarlin herself. Around the room you will see various sitters, three from each Aja, and Jennifer Chian Garcia's Liana, Keeper of the Chronicles, off to the right. Here in the center of the hall we have a group of Aes Sedai that we will see again in the trailer later, but from the center of the group is Moraine, flanked by Priyanka Bose as Alana, and Kate Flanagan as Leandrin. This is apparently a sitting of the hall that has been sealed to the hall, as there are not other spectators. As we will see in a bit, there appears to be ample room for other sisters to observe a sitting of the hall, but yet these are the only women witnessing this. This is likely a report to the Amarlin, but also possibly some type of disciplinary action, which I'll explain a little bit more here in a moment. Next, we see Sophie Akinato as Swan Sanche, the Amarlin C. You can see her seven striped stole, in an incredibly intricate dress. The tattoos, however, are a contrast to that dress, and it may show that she had a different origin, which of course she does, growing up as a fisherman's daughter in Tyr. We then cut to a shot of Moraine being healed of what appears to be an arrow wound by Kareen Nagashi, played by Claire Perkins. Again, see the green gem in her great serpent ring indicating her Aja. This is also our first look at channeling in the trailer, and you can see the flows of the power moving from Kareen into Moraine, being channeled through her. Now, would I have liked to have seen the actual flows of the One Power as in the individual strands? Yes. I think that the Wheel of Time magic system is one of the most distinctive in fantasy, so I certainly wanted to see it brought to life as described, but there are a number of reasons why different color flows might be confusing to the audience. For now, I'm all right with it as I think the flows of the power look cool. I just wish they were looked a little bit less like smoke and more like actual weaving. Very slight ding from me. We then move to a wide shot of Emmons Field during Winter Night. You can see much of the village on fire, and Moraine is channeling a lot of the One Power. There are wisps of the power coming in from many, many angles. Now this might appear to be in the midst of a battle, but I think at closer look, this is likely after it's over. You can see bodies all over the place and land standing there seemingly not fighting. It appears this might be after the fighting, and Moraine may be pulling in water to put out the fires? Who knows? We then move to a shot of four sisters of the Red Aja staring at something with their very natural RBF that only a red sister could pull off. The blonde sister here is Leandrin, again played by Kate Flanagan. We are then back in the Hall of the Tower, and Liana is slamming her staff against the ground. Look at the intensity on her face. This makes me believe that she was actually trying to quiet everybody down rather than welcoming in the Amarlin. I think she looks a little angry for that. We then move to a group of Aes Sedai that includes Nynaeve in the front left, Stepin played by Peter Franzen on the right, Alana in the middle, and then in the back right we have Ivan who is one of Alana's warders played by Emmanuel Amani, and then in the left back is Maskim played by Taylor Napier who is another of Alana's warders. There there appears to be someone in front of Alana as well, and judging by the next shot, I think that's likely to be Lan. They are staring into the distance, and because they are all in the same positions as the next shot, I'm assuming they're staring at the group of Dragon Sworn who are about to attack them. We see Alana use the One Power to block arrows in the sky, which look like they have been fired from the trees. Absent from this shot are Moraine, Kareen Nagashi, and Leandrin, all of whom we know are with this party at the moment. But again, I'll explain what's happening there in a moment. 
Now in this shot where the arrows were stopped, you see Lan's sword drawn stepping in front of Nynaeve to take arrows in case Alana can't stop him. I think everybody is totally shipping Nynaeve and Lan here and I, I'm on board with that. We then move back to a landscape shot looking south in Tarvalin from the other angle as the previous shot. We can see the two bridges that lead to the bridge towns of Osenrein on the far left and Degain, which you can see just the bridge heading to. Also here is the Ogier Grove, almost right where it should be in Tarvalin. Now, given that the city is smaller here than in the books, they move the grove a little bit north in the city, and that's okay to me because they made the city smaller. I'm just happy it's in there. Now, we get this amazing landscape shot of Shadar Logoth in the background, and Matt and Perrin in the foreground moving away from the ruined city. Now, this is likely after they're split up while in Shadar Logoth. Matt is looking backwards because they have clearly left others behind, unsure if they made it. And I can totally see Rand being concerned about that, especially Egwene. Now, you can see the city is right up against the bank of a river, which we know is the River Arenel, but we will come back to that. We then move to this shot of Rand aiming his bow into the sky. Now, in a blink or you miss it shot, there is another man and a horse right next to him. Rand is also wearing the bluish shirt that we see him wearing in the village earlier in the trailer. My guess is this is Rand and Tam on the quarry road. And that, ladies and gentlemen, right there is Bella. We then see a shot of Matt holding the Shadar Logoth dagger, apparently the scene where he first discovers it. Again, like the other trailer that we saw with Matt and the dagger, he appears to be alone here. So there is likely a change to how they go about things in Shadar Logoth. There may be no more death, and it seems like Matt has kind of gone off on his own. We then see Mashadar creeping up on Egwene, Perrin, and Rand as they kind of stare on at it. Clearly at some point right after this, Rand gets separated from them because Egwene and Perrin end up on the top of the ramparts of the city with Mashadar closing in around them. Likely this is where they jump into the water to escape from the top of the walls, and this is how they become separated. Now Mashadar is less like the fog described in the book and a little bit more like darkness that's alive here which i actually like i think this feels a little bit more creepy to me than fog would have i like this change we now move on to a shot of matt but what's behind him is actually the important piece here this appears to be an aiel in a cage with a bunch of arrows in him at least you can see the red hair and the shufa if i had to guess i'm gonna say that this is actually at faldara based on the stonework behind him and the fact that Matt looks a little bit more cleaned up at this point. We also know that the Aiel and Shinarans do not always get along, so it's possible they captured him or killed him and, and hung him up here. We then get a shot of a wolf and then one of Perrin reacting to said wolf. I love that we get the wolves here in the trailer and just for my headcanon, by the way, that is Hopper until we know otherwise. We then get some sexy time here with Rand and Egwene. First, I thought this was the Wine Spring Inn, but judging by the stonework, I'm gonna go ahead again and say this is Faldara. I doubt Rand and Egwene would both be naked in the common room of her father's inn anyway. That seems a little awkward, especially when people might walk in. I love how Rand looks at her with love, and then she looks away though, pondering something else as well. Also notice her hair is not braided here. At this point, my guess is that Egwene has decided to become an Aes Sedai and unbraided her hair, but who knows. This could also be the beginning of the end of their relationship, as she looks away and the voice over here is of Tam saying something about heartbreak. We then move to a shot of Matt and Perrin sitting in a building in Shadar Logoth before it gets dark. It still looks light outside. I would guess this boredom is what leads Matt to run off and explore and grab the dagger. Possibly, just me guessing, the act of grabbing the dagger is what summons Mashadar in the first place and separates the group. Just a thought. We then get some shots that symbolize what is being said in the voiceover. Tam says that the wheel keeps turning, and as he does, we get this shot of the Beltine Festival and dancing as they make a circle and it's a wheel. Then it pans to a circle of dead bodies wrapped in white with the Aes Sedai at the center. You can see Moraine here with Leandrin and the three other reds from earlier. Then you see Alana and the other greens, but no Kareen, which we will talk about here in a moment. You can also see fire in the hands of the Aes Sedai. So they are likely about to use the power to set the bodies on fire in the pyre, just like we saw back in the scene earlier with Stepin crying. Also in this scene off to the right, you see Nynaeve just kind of standing there staring. 
Then we keep the theme of circles as and wheels as we see the Hall of the Tower again with Swan ascending to the Amarlin Sea in the same scene that we saw earlier. You can then see as the hall rises up into the tower and there are areas around where you could put a lot of Aes Sedai to view or watch the sitting of the hall. Also in the floor there, you can see the seven colors of the seven Ajas. And then we get our first glimpse of a Murdral sitting upon its horse. Now in this scene, we only see the Murdral's lips and not its eyeless gaze, but I will say, that looks creepy AF. Now in this clip, we get someone holding Lan at knife point. This is Nynaeve and Lan's words here are almost word for word from the leaked audition script from last year. This indicates that Nynaeve has caught up with Lan and Moraine after the events of Shadar Logoth and has snuck up on Lan. Now likely in this scene, he's about to ask her if she will heal Moraine as she is injured. And then we get the scene of a Murdral and Trolloc surrounding him. You can see the skull mask on the horse and the eyeless face of the Murdral here. One thing I love is the different types of Trollocs that you can see. There are different horns and faces and different animals. I think this looks awesome. We then move to this scene of Matt and Rand running away from someone or something. A couple of things to denote here. Matt and Rand are not carrying all of their things and Rand is not wearing the cloak we see him with as he's leaving the two rivers and that we see him wearing later near the way gate. I also don't see his sword, which implies that they are staying in an inn somewhere or they're staying somewhere else and they're not traveling with everything they have. My guess is this is another town they stop in after they have been separated in Shadar Logoth. I would guess this is also the town that they meet Tom Marilyn in. Now, as to who they are running from, I think this is a white cloak. We see the white cape flaring as the character runs. Uh, could this be right as Rand gets all cocky during his channeling sickness and starts getting smart with the white cloaks? Or maybe Matt has just played a prank? Who knows? We then cut to the scene of what are either Dragonsworn or followers of Loghain moving through a forest. They are likely a part of the attack that we saw earlier in the trailer. We see a quick clip of Lan fighting them and then an eerie shot of Loghain's face played by Alvaro Morte. Now the crackling on his face is actually the shield the Aes Sedai have on him. As it expands, this is Loghain breaking through the shield as he's likely taking advantage of the fight going on outside. As the shield expands and breaks, you can see the force of that break knock the two Aes Sedai holding it on Loghain, Leandrin and Kareen, they're both pushed out of their chairs. Now Kareen appears to hit her head on the pillar and she may or may not die in this scene. We'll come back to that in a minute. We then cut back to Nynaeve seemingly in shock as fighting is going on all around her. Again, this is likely all a part of the same attack on their camp. We then cut to this scene right outside the Hall of the Tower with Moraine leaving the hall. Outside already are the group of sisters that we saw previously inside the hall with her. Also of note here, notice the brown sisters behind her all have their backs turned to Moraine. Could this be Moraine being publicly punished by the Hall of the Tower and by Swan? It would make sense to cover for her actions and then later have Swan meet with her privately to kind of mislead people from thinking they're working together. Now what is likely happened here is that the other sisters were sent out so Moraine could be punished. Also of note here, Moraine has on her key Sierra. Rafe was not lying when he said it would be in the show. We then cut to the scene of the Amarlin speaking with someone and telling them that the last battle is coming. Now just based on the earring here, I'm going to go out on a limb and say this is Nynaeve, but I'm not sure about that. We then cut to a very blurred scene of a number of Trollocs hoisting their weapons into the sky. As we move forward a bit here, we see the dragon sworn from earlier rushing out the group of Aes Sedai. Now this is likely after the arrow shot that we saw earlier in the trailer because in the background of this shot you can see the group of them standing ready for battle in the same formation as that scene. Now we cut back to the cave where we saw Loghain break out of the shield earlier. You can see Kareen's body on the ground at Moraine's feet, likely dead from the blast. Moraine is apparently attempting to shield and hold Loghain. Here is Stepan uh, in a form of like a berserker rage is flying at the shielded Loghain. My guess is Moraine was being healed by Kareen was resting on a cot. When that shield blew, Moraine stood up in her weakened state and is trying to hold Loghain here. I have a feeling she won't be able to and Loghain will escape, but that's just my guess. We then cut back to Winter Knight and land fighting against the Trollocs. Now you can see the one power being woven around and the Trollocs are shielding their eyes to whatever Moraine is doing here. And as they do, you see Lan able to swipe his sword and kill all three of them at once. I love how it seems like Moraine and Lan are working together while they're fighting, which would be explained in the fact that they have a Bond. We then cut to a scene of Rand, Matt, Nynaeve, and Lan riding up to the Waygate to meet what appears to be Moraine, Perrin, 
Egwene and a mysterious other figure that I believe is loyal, but we'll have to wait and see. The trailer flashes and shows us the merge roll slowly riding into the village of the two rivers or Emmonsfield or whatever they decide to go with. But you can tell this is the village because that's the Wine Spring Inn in the background. We then see the Merdral crying out with his mouth open and rows of jagged teeth and an eyeless face. Yes, this is a change from the books in the way that Merdral are described, but I absolutely love this effect here. I think they are gonna be able to play up the horror trope and that thing looks horrifying. What I'm hoping they do though is talk. I want the merge roll to actually speak because that I think will add to the creepiness factor. I really cannot wait to hear a merge roll's voice. We then pan to the shots of the battle on winter night. Lan has just killed a Trolloc right in front of him, which you can see very well actually. And then in the background, a Trolloc appears to be eating a villager while holding on to a torch in its other hand. You can then see a slight blue light on Lan's face as Moraine begins to channel. You then see Moraine channeling the one power to fight and Lan is rolling around on the ground and defending her with his sword against Trollocs. They almost appear to be flows of air that Moraine is throwing around. Her final act here though is to call lightning that ends the trailer and kills the remaining Trollocs. We then move to the title card for the show and bam, the trailer is over. So that was a ton to go over, but there is so much packed into this. I have two more videos planned this week in regards to this trailer, so keep an eye out for those. I'll be getting into the things that we did not see in the trailer that we know are going to be in there. And then I will have a breakdown of how I think the first six episodes will play out based on what we know so far. So you don't want to miss either one of those. Make sure to subscribe to the channel going forward if you aren't already so you can be updated when I get new videos out. Make sure to hit the bell icon to get all of the notifications. We'll have tons of coverage on the show, of course and I will keep going with lore videos about the book series as well. It is an absolutely exciting time to be a Wheel of Time fan. Leave a comment on this video and let me know what you thought of the trailer and this breakdown. Did you learn anything new? Is there anything I missed? Let me know. Thank you to my patrons for supporting me. Making this type of content is very, very time consuming and you guys all make it very, very worth it. Thank you for all of the support. If you would like to become a patron, click the link in the description of the video and you can find out different ways that you can support the channel. Thank you everybody for watching and until next time, peace out. Tinker in the kitchen with a job of work to do. Mistress up above, slipping on a robe of blue. She prances down the staircase, a fancy oh so free, crying, Tinker, oh dear Tinker, won't you mend a pot for me?